The opening words are by Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut became very popular in the 60s and 70s. He was the author of, among many, many novels, but Slaughterhouse-Five you might recognize, and uh, he remained part, he was countercultural. And the other thing you need to know about this opening reading is, when I mention the Sermon on the Mount, in the Greek Bible, of which you have an English translation, it was Matthew chapter five, and, and it was called, and it's when Jesus gave what he called the Beatitudes. Blessed are those. So this is what Jesus said, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are those who are persecuted. So now here's what Kurt Vonnegut said. How do humanists feel about Jesus? I, a humanist, say of Jesus, if what he said is good, and so much of it is absolutely beautiful, what does it matter if he was God or not? If Jesus had not delivered the Sermon on the Mount with its beatitudes, with this message of mercy and pity, I would not want to be a human being. I'd just as soon be a rattlesnake. For some reason, the most vocal Christians among us never mention the Beatitudes. But often, with tears in their eyes, they demand that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings. And of course, that's Moses, not Jesus. I have not heard of these Christians demand that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, be posted anywhere. Blessed are the merciful in a courtroom, Blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon. Give me a break. <laughs> Part of the argument put forth by politically right-leaning evangelical and fundamentalist Christians is that because they are, they insist, a Christian nation, and indeed 85% of Americans declare themselves Christian, they have a right as the majority to have America governed their mandated way. Now, of course, the Constitution, and especially our Bill of Rights, prevents the majority Christian people from dictating to the minority non-Christians separation of church and state protects us from the tyranny of the majority. Now this leads to a big what if. What if all the people in our country who say they are Christians in fact acted as Christians? <laughs> the first problem that raises, what does, what makes, this is the first question that raises, what makes a person a Christian? There is no such a thing as Christianity. There are hundreds of Christianities an embarrassing variety of religious sects and cults, most of which claim to be uniquely the true Christianity. Put a Mormon and a Roman Catholic in the room together and see what you get. I will simplify this for purposes of getting to the main question. I have a lot of chutzpah, so I'm gonna tell you what I define as, Christi as a Christian. Okay, this is my, I'm, I'm given a sermon I can claim. I define a Christian as a person who knows and understands the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. A Jewish teacher, charismatic faith healer, and political radical who lived 2,000 years ago. A Christian dedicates oneself to following those teachings and example. A Christian is a person whose life reflects Jesus' values. Remember the bumper sticker, WWJD? What would Jesus do? This is what a Christian would do. I loved it back during the Vietnam War when my, my friends, many of whom were devout Christians, would argue in favor of the war. And I'd say, gee, I wonder what would Jesus, would he carry a, color, a, a repeat we a weapon? That, that usually stopped them. This leads to another problem. How can we know who Jesus was? How can we know? How can we know what he lived and taught? 
In order to know that, we can turn to church tradition and scriptures. However, church traditions vary, give us conflicting truths, and the scriptures are not reliable. The scriptures have been subtracted from, added to, and corrupted in part over the years. They contain errors and contradictions. But I believe I can get a good idea of the true life and teachings of Jesus. Shortly after Jesus' death, people began to meet together to celebrate his life and follow his teachings. The earliest Christians, they would get together in people's homes, and they would talk about how they, what Jesus taught and how they would go try to follow them. These were Jews. These were mostly Jews, and they were Christian Jews. So the first 300 years of Christian life, they had tremendously diverse views about Jesus and what he said and did. There was no one doctrine or one belief. There are hundreds of different versions of Jesus' words, countless gospels. Today we have the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four in the Greek Testament, but back then there were dozens of gospels. This diversity continued until the time of the Emperor Constantine, who in the fourth century converted to Christianity. Until then, he was persecuting the Christians. He converted to Christianity and decided to use the church to help unify the empire. So the church and state were going to be one. To that end, he called church leaders together and told them to settle on one creed, one dogma, one scripture. So they did that, and they settled many things. They chose the Roman Sunday, S-U-N, Sunday, as the Christian Sabbath day. They fixed Jesus' birthday. He was probably born in August. If, if you read the scriptures he was, if, and you read the signs and all, that was probably August. But they fixed his birthday to correspond with the pagan celebration of the winter solstice, December 22nd, 25. And they chose the symbol of the sun, the cross of light, to be the official church emblem. They decided which books would be the official scripture, and they banned all others. They began the process of destroying unofficial books. There were lots of scriptures back then that if they, didn't, they voted, and the ones that didn't make it, they had burned. They also decided on the formulation of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which made God one God in three persons. This is when they decided this. At this time, including, they made Jesus a man God. That was a Greek concept. They, you know, the Greeks said they're gods. And so this is how the idea of Jesus being God came in. It was the Greek influence. Historians estimate that one million Unitarian Christian Jews who believed in the unity of God during that time were killed because of their belief. You could be a Unitarian Jew until Constantine came along, but when they said there's one dogma, if you were a Unitarian then, that you could be killed. The Christian scripture we have today were written down long after Jesus died based on oral tradition. They were written in Greek, which was the language and culture of the literary people of that time. You know, the Romans ruled but they allowed the Greeks to be the cultural elite. So if, you, if you, were, you were studied in Greek and you learned Greek and culture was Greek. Neil Douglas Klotz, his name, was, that's his last name, Douglas hyphen Klotz, K-L-O-T-Z, wrote a book titled The Hidden Gospel. Once again, the gospel means the good news. So this is the hidden good news which is his attempt to decode the spiritual message of the Aramaic Jesus. Jesus didn't speak Hebrew, he, he, he spoke Aramaic. He didn't speak Greek, he spoke Aramaic. So, The hidden gospel reveals the spirituality behind Jesus' teaching from Middle Eastern Aramaic-speaking viewpoint. The sources we have for this work are gospels written in Aramaic in the third century, based on all tradition of Aramaic-speaking Middle Eastern people, They're mostly Syriac Aramaic. So we do have such things, and, we, and these are the closest to Jesus' words. There are some important differences between classical Greek world 
in the Middle Eastern Aramaic world. It's not a matter of like just translating, like you take this word and translate it to that. The worldviews were totally different. The worldviews were totally different. The Greek worldview, for example, was dualistic. Spirit and body, separate. The Aramaic world was unified. Body and spirit are one. In Aramaic, for example, breath and air are the same word. Breath and air are the same word. Breath was a word that they used for the concept of Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was breath. Not God, not king, not some, but breath. In Aramaic, every word and thought has layers of meaning, and any word can take on varying meaning, meanings. It's not that way in Greek. Greek, every word has a specific meaning. Aramaic spirituality is circular. When I was a young man, I was, to, I was told that women have organic, circular spirituality, and I, as a man, had linear spirituality, and that was true, I did. But Aramaic was organic, circular, nonlinear, metaphoric, multi-layered. Greek is linear, theological, and dualistic. To get at Jesus' spiritual teachings, Douglas Klotz used Aramaic versions of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, plus the more recently recovered Gospel of Thomas. We have found some Gospels that they thought were all destroyed, but we've found them more recently, and Thomas is one. Let's begin by considering Jesus' understanding of God. Look at the prayer he taught his followers. Remember, I, earlier I did the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, which in Greek begin with the words, Our Father. You know, the Greeks considered their gods kings, fathers, rulers, but in Aramaic, God has many layers layers and shades of meaning. God is the one from which all breath is given. God is the one from which all breath is given. Not a, not a father, not a king. Breath. The parent of the universe, the being from which waves of shining light emanate, God is the fruitful, nurturing life giver, male and female. The sound which rings throughout the universe Om, that sound. The father mother who brings unity, that brings, that which vibrates life into the being in every instant. God vibrates life into being at every instant. Now, those of you who know your subatomic particle stuff, this is, what, this is what they do. They vibrate life into being. So these guys are right 3,000 years ago. For Jesus, the sacred and the natural natural or part of each other, not separated. He was an ecologist. No, a, we don't separate nature and, 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 and nature and the sacred is one. In Aramaic, the word for God, Alaha, A-L-A-H-A, means sacred unity. That's what it means. Oneness, Unitarian. The all, the ultimate power and potential. God is the one unity. Only one, only one being exists. One being exists. All other beings, including us, have life within that being. So God is breath and light, and we have life within that. Arabic-speaking Christians in the Middle East today, and all Muslims today, use the term Allah to refer to God. Allah means unity. By the way, if you want to be a Muslim, all you have to say is there's one God, Muhammad is his prophet, and you're a Muslim. The Aramaic Jesus would not have thought God apart, he would not have thought of God apart from his community, nature, or political forces. No separation. Everything was intertwined, including we are in God. Now let's move, that was the first, the first great question human beings wrestle with, philosophy and theology, is who or what is God? The second great question is, who am I? What does it mean to be a human being? What is the nature of human being? The Aramaic Jesus answer to that question derives directly from the answer to what or who or what is God. The divine is unity. Humans are created in the image of the divine, Genesis, that is to say, we are a projection of and a part of that unity. 
Forget about the rib thing and all that stuff. I mean, <laughs> that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that we, we look like God. It means that we're part of God, God's image. And the Genesis story tells us Adam was the first human. The name Adam refers to a non-gendered, neither male nor female being, made up of juice, wine, and the essence of life. Adam was the first human, but not male or female. Now, the third great question is, what is my purpose in life? What gives my life meaning? Why the heck am I here? In the words of the Aramaic Jesus, we are fulfilled when we recognize and pursue the purpose of our lives. When we realize our own I am. You know, in the, in the Bible, when the, in the Old Testament, when someone had asked God, who are you? What's your name? He says, I am. Well, Jesus said, you recognize your own I am, and then you fulfill that. You live into it. That's our purpose. How do we come to realize this? Well, we pray. What does it mean to pray? The Aramaic concept is to bend toward something, to listen to, to lay a snare for. We pray when we open a space for the feeling of the sacred. Leave space, do not fill space, emptiness, not busyness. That's meditation, right? This is what you do when you meditate. We pray by sitting quietly, silencing our busy voices, opening ourselves to be filled. By the way, Jesus told us when he taught the Lord's Prayer, he said, when you, when, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites and go pray in public in front of people. Don't do that. No public school prayer, none of that stuff. Go into your closet and pray. Go into your closet and pray. Now, this is what he meant by closet. He didn't mean like, well, okay, I did that. For seven days during the World Series, I went into my closet and prayed. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> when you want to lay yourself open to the divine, this is what prayer is, open, leave yourself open, go into your inner place. This is what it says in the Bible, the closet. But to go into your inner place here, to that story or symbol that reminds you of the sacred, Close the doors of your awareness to the public person you think yourself to be. Pray to the parent of creation with your inner sense, the outer senses turned within. That's what you're doing when you're meditating. You take your outer senses, turn them within. By opening yourself to the flow of the sacred, somewhere resounding in some inner form, the swell of the divine ocean can move through you. When you're praying, the divine moves through you. The breathing life of all reveals itself. You're breathing in and out, and you're breathing the life. Source of life, in and out. In this way, you live your life. This is the way you live your life. Not just prayer, but you live. The Jesus also said, said, pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. This is why meditation is the queen of spiritual meditation, spiritual discipline. Prayerful meditation is breathing, Pay attention to your breathing. Breathe in concert with other people and in concert with the breath of the universe so that you are opened, emptied, and you experience the oneness of everything, the unity which some people call God. This is what you experience. The most quoted verse in Christian scripture, and you see this when you go to football and some sporting events, John, John 3.16, you see, you know, like, Posters, John 3, 16. For God so loved, this is the Greek translation, the, the translation of the Greek. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's what you get from the Aramaic. Unity, for unity, loved diversity, all the worlds of form that have brought you a child of unity, Fulfilled in all aspects of life. Who is Jesus? A child of the unity, fulfilled in all aspects of life. So that whoever would have the same confidence in their own fulfillment, like the earth underneath supporting all, would not fade with their form, but continue from world to world, within and ever, with and in ever-living life. 
Jesus was a human being, fully realized his oneness with all life. He was a child of the unity, fully realized and whole in himself. He showed us the way to be fully human. This is what Jesus did. If people ask me, what was, what was it that Jesus did? Jesus showed us that I'd be fully human. So that if we follow his example and teaching, once again, we too shall realize the fullness of ourselves and experience the unity with all of life. Yeshua Ba Alaha is the Aramaic name for Jesus. Jesus, the son of unity in translation. The one nameless being who restores. The name affirms a greater reality, greater than the individual, the unity, and includes a particular person, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeshua, Joshua, Bar, Elaha. One title used in the Bible for Jesus, the Greek Bible, is Son of Man. Son of Man means human being. That's what it means. It is an anti-title. A claim to being simply human. If you call yourself the Son of Man, you're saying, I'm a human being. In the Gospel of Thomas, Son of Man refers to a complete, fully human person. Another title in the Greek scripture is Son of God. Son of God means an adopted son of Allah, not an exclusive one. Jesus showed us how any human being could come to consciously realize oneself as an adopted child of God. That's what, God, what Jesus showed us. The Aramaic for children of God means you shall be hollowed out and become a channel for unity. Grade yourself now on, on when, I, how I, when I say about what Jesus taught and who Jesus was. I did this for myself, and I came out 50%. You come after me and hurt me, I'll forgive you once. The second time, I'm going to go after you. I'm not going to sell my house and my bed and go out and, live, and give it to the money. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to turn my cheek, and I'm not, I'm not going to forgive you seven times 70. I'm just not going to do that. So I'm not going to call myself a Christian. <laughs> Jesus taught that all men and women are deserving of love. And if we love one another as we love ourselves, we can be made whole. He proclaimed a new law, which is to be kept in our hearts, a law based on respect for all of life. He called on us to worship by living our beliefs. He called on us to do unto others as we would have, to want, have them do unto us. He emphasized the unity of all humankind, none of the separate stuff, none of you, you, you versus us, unity of all humankind, the possibility that each one of us could achieve harmony in our own lives, union with the unity. He taught us to seek the truth within us. He taught us to pray by opening ourselves to realize the truth which passes all understanding and is in us already. We already know what's true. It's in here. Go inside and find out. Jesus' life instructs us because of his witness. He spoke out against the leaders of his time, leaders in the synagogue, the leaders in the, in the political leaders. He spoke out against them. He exposed the hypocrisy of the leadership. He exposed their wickedness. He called out the priests, the keepers of the temple. He challenged their perversions. Jesus demonstrated love to the outcasts, the poor and the unloved. He consorted with sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, adulterers, lesbians, gays, trans, other so-called undesirables. He did not worry about his reputation. As a matter of fact, he sought out those people. He did not have dinner and supper with the leaders. He had it with the poor people. He lived according to his conscience. He stood up to his accusers and judges without flinching, and he did this unto his death. When he went to Jerusalem, he knew he was going to die for what he believed. If we were to follow Jesus, we would have no capital punishment. The majority of people, including Christians in this country, love their capital punishment. 
Remember when the crowd gathered to stone to death a woman caught in adultery? Jesus said, let the one among you who has no sin throw the first stone. As I read the Bible, no one threw a stone that day. He would be working for a minimum wage if he were here today, which guarantees every person who works in this country can live with dignity, which would include health insurance. We would work for affordable housing as a high priority. This is what he'd be doing. Abraham Lincoln, oh man, my favorite all-time president, he said, and I'm quoting Lincoln, we should do for ourselves collectively through our government the things the market system does not do at all or do as well. Amen. What would it look like if we acted our Christian values? Anne Lamott came close to envisioning this in these words. I'm, I'm quoting Anne Lamott now. You are not the cold clay lump you leave behind when you die. You are not your collection of walking personality disorders. You are spirit, you are love, you are here to love, to be loved, and when you come to die, what will matter are the memories of beauty that people loved you and you loved them. Jesus exemplified love, mercy, forgiveness, and compassion, righteousness, and peace. He welcomed and blessed the children. Commanded us to love our enemies. That's another place where I fail. Turn the other cheek. Forgive 70 times 70, to go the second mile, to put down our swords, and to embody peace. He commanded us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, welcome the stranger, help those who are impressed, oppressed. Are these the values we see lived out in our country? I would say, in fact, that the values lived out by the majority of people in our country, including the Christians, are exactly 180 degrees opposite. The problem, as I see it, is that Christians are not living Christian values. Unitarian, Kurt Vonnegut, had it exactly right. And that reading I gave for opening reading, I'm going to do a reprise now. This is what he said. Blessed are the merciful in a courtroom, no capital punishment in the Pentagon, no immune, no immune commissions in our prisons, equal justice for the rich and poor, Next part is hard, black and white. Refusal to use torture of prisoners under any circumstance. Are those the values that we have in our country? Blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon. Give me a break. If we were living Christian values, our money is budgeted. <coughs> for peacemaking would far outstrip a budget for war making. For one example, if Jesus had not delivered the Sermon on the Mount, I would rather be a rattlesnake. Amen. <laughs>